It's always good when the guy in the live stream matches the guy sitting in my chair, so. Okay, success. Plus I had the same shirt on last week, I don't know, so. Okay. <clears throat> All right, good evening, everyone. It's sort of sunny out, I think, but it did rain last night though. <laughs> All right, let us, uh, let us get started here and let me move this down so I get this out of my way. Okay. All right. Good evening, Terrell. Let's get started here and let's pray. Father. Mm. Father, we Father, we come here in gratitude. We come, we come as people who are who are, yes, redeemed, but Lord, we are people who are not yet glorified we come as people who have been justified but we still have that last step in the chain that we have not achieved yet so we still have we still have work to do we still have to get to the end and we have to we still have to obey commands because we still have the ability to disobey commands father i pray that we would obey i pray that we would obey far more than we would disobey Father, we need your spirit's help. We need your spirit's guidance. We need your spirit's prompting. We need your spirit causing us to obey. So we ask for that. And we ask for it because you promised that your spirit will do that for us. So we ask, we ask Lord in faith. We, we ask knowing that you are the promise keeper and your word is good. It is true. And you do not lie to your people or to anybody. Father, as we study matters tonight concerning marriage and sexuality, I pray that it would be faithful to your word. I pray that we would be uh, sensitive on sensitive topics. I pray that we would be understanding and loving with each other. I pray, Lord, that uh, it would be a help to your people, and, and I pray that it honors you. So I ask all this in the name of your son. Amen. Okay, in the book, if you have the book, picking up on page 712 and the actual section on adultery, and we're going to just look at some passages that address the fact that adultery, I think we're all aware of this, adultery is not just an Old Covenant, Old Testament matter, it is carried into the New Covenant and the New Testament, but just so that we have our scriptural basis for what we're talking about, we'll start in Matthew chapter 15, and we'll work our way through the New Testament with some examples of what scripture has to say in the New Covenant concerning this matter of adultery. We know that in Exodus chapter 20, it is clearly stated that adultery is something that the Lord does not want, does not want his people to do. Exodus 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. So let's go to what uh, Matthew 15 has to say. First, Jesus is speaking. And he says to the guys, and I will start in verse 17. Peter's asked a question in verse 15, but he says in verse 17, do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? But, contrast, whatever comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, these are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. I know, I know that the point here is going, his, his point is really addressing this issue of eating with unwashed hands, but for our purposes here, I just wanted us to see that Jesus lumps in adultery with evil thoughts, with murder, with other sexual immorality, with theft, with false witness, and with slander. We go over a couple more pages, and we go into Matthew chapter 19. When we're looking at what Jesus has to say about, <clears throat> about this matter in Matthew chapter 19, as he has his encounter with the rich young man. In Matthew 19, he says in verse 16, Scripture tells us, And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? 
And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. So the man asked the the. The man asked Jesus, which commandments does he need to keep to enter life? And Jesus peels off a few there on murder, adultery, stealing, and bearing false witness, loving your neighbor as yourself, and honoring your father and mother. Let's go now to Luke 18, verse, uh, the verse in question is verse 20. Same account. Repetition in scripture is for emphasis. People say, why why are the same things in multiple gospels? Well, they're there multiple times because we need to hear it more than once to get it. Verse 18, "And and a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Same thing. Adultery is is categorized with murder, stealing, false witness, and the charge to honor your father and mother. Now, I know that we may have somebody watching out there somewhere at some time who's going to say, well, the words of Jesus are not binding upon God's people. Now, if you've never heard that, that's not a bad thing. But there is a strain of teaching out there that does say that the words of Jesus are not binding upon Christians. They're only binding upon the Jews of Jesus's day. So we don't, we don't, we can move on from the Gospels and still know that we have teaching on adultery in Paul's epistles, because some people say that uh, uh, only what Paul says is binding concerning God's people and their behavior. We don't believe that. We believe <laughs> Jesus's words are quite binding upon God's people. All right, Romans chapter 2. Verse 17, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. But verse 22 is our verse. You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? He's not not saying in any way, shape, or form that that the charge to not commit adultery is not true. He's talking about people who are teachers here, people who are teaching others, and they're proclaiming that you should not be committing adultery. We can go to one other passage in Romans. Romans. Let's go to chapter 13. In Romans 13, verse 8, Paul writes, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law for the commandments. And you'll notice your ESV has quotation marks starting there after the comma in commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So loving your neighbor as yourself, what are elements of love that look like that? Well, one of the elements of love that loves our neighbor as ourself is the loving command to not commit adultery. Next, let's go to James, James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin, and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point of it has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. 
you will note in your ESV, those are quotations. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. You transgress the law by murder. You transgress the law by adultery also. Let's go to one more, 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 12, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong is the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. The eyes full of adultery are equated with an insatiable desire for sin. Okay, so I think we, we have a reasonable scripture basis here in the New Covenant, in the New Testament for adultery still being sin, still being wrong, just like it was in the Old Testament. But what are the, some of the consequences of this? What, what happens when adultery, when adultery happens? Well, um, Dr. Grudem lists some things on 713 of the book, and I think they're, I think they're valuable. Uh, the first one he lists is, is that adultery wrongly intrudes another person into the one flesh relationship of marriage. Let's think about what marriage, marriage is. Again, marriage is the union of one man and one woman. You bring another man or another woman into that part of the relationship, which is only supposed to be carried out within that relationship by the man, by the woman who are husband and wife, and you break that oneness. This, this, is, this is why scripture equates idolatry, rebellion against God by God's people as adultery. Because you've got the image in the Old Testament, just like you have in the New, of the Lord being the bridegroom and God's people being the bride. And when God's people go and turn away from their husband, from the bridegroom, the Lord, they are turning away and they are breaking that oneness of the relationship. There's, there's that one flesh image there in that as well. Because this, this knowledge that God has of his people is not just, again, a mere cognitive intellectual fact. It's an intimate relationship he has with his people. And you know, we've talked about this a, a gazillion times. Marriage between man and woman is meant to reflect that relationship between God and mirror that relationship between God and his people. Adultery, whether it is spiritual adultery, adultery against the Lord, or whether it is physical adultery, against a human spouse, it breaks that relationship. And because it breaks that relationship on the human level, what else does it do? Well, one of the consequences that it, that it ends up doing is it ends up causing mistrust. Um, sad to say, even without adultery happening, you run into marriages more than you think where spouses don't trust each other. Um, I've asked people, do you trust the person sitting next to you who is your spouse? I'll leave it generic there. And quite often the answer is silence for five or 10 seconds because they're thinking about whether or not they trust their spouse. And this is even when in, in, in these relationships, in these marriages where adultery hasn't even happened yet. What would happen if adultery happened in that relationship, in that marriage? If there's mistrust now, quite often because in these relationships, there's mistrust where there's no basis for mistrust. Why don't you trust your spouse? I don't know. I just don't. Well, that's, that's a pretty lousy reason to mistrust your spouse. <laughs> that if your spouse hasn't done anything wrong to cause you to mistrust them, to mistrust him or mistrust her, why do you not trust them? Are, are you just so paranoid? Are you just so afraid? Um, well, you know, they did say I do or I will or whatever vow they wrote when when you got married, 
But think about if adultery then happens, if sexual sin happens, how much more the greater level of mistrust between spouses happens. Um, so, so adultery has consequences. Adultery can result, you know, we know from David's situation, adultery can result in children being born. And in David's case, we can see it resulted in a child being, in a child being born, a child dying too. So adult, and, and we know that especially in our day, adultery can result in not uh, in a child being conceived. And the way that people deal with child children being conceived that they don't want now is they just go to Planned Parenthood or some abortion mill and have the child killed. So there's a murder that goes on in many cases along with the adultery. And even beyond that, adultery can really wreck a, a person's entire life. You know, somebody might lose their career. They might lose their family. They might lose their relationship with their children, their friends. They, they may lose a lot of things. And scripture talks about that. Let's go to Proverbs 6 and look what scripture has to say about this. Proverbs 6, verse 20. Seven. It's right in the middle of the bottom of the page. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and, a, and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. Let's go to Proverbs 7. Proverbs 7, verse 21, as we have an extended teaching here about about the adulteress in verse 5, the forbidden woman. But we go to verse 21 in Proverbs 7, with much seductive speech she persuades him. With her smooth talk she compels him. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast, till an arrow pierces its liver as a bird rushes into a snare. He does not know that it will cost him his life. And, and you can even think about the fact that in the old, in the covenant given to Moses at Sinai, adultery was a capital offense, punishable by death. This was not merely um, somebody got a time out or something, or they went to detention, or they went on Oprah and asked for forgiveness, that it was a capital offense back then. This was, this was serious business. And, and let's back up two chapters here as we're getting to our last passage in the Proverbs. Proverbs 5. Proverbs 5, verse 3. Once again, this is about the forbidden woman. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O oh sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give her your honor, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed and you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. Okay. Now, you know, I, think, I think it's, it's important to remember here, this is, these Proverbs are written in the context of a father talking to his son. And this is not merely talking about a father talking to an eight-year-old boy. This is certainly gets, I think you get the, the sense here that this son is of an adult age. That the child, the son here is not eight years old. The son is, is one being tempted by this forbidden woman. So I think the sense you get here is that this is talking about a grown son. 
And the cha- the challenge here that that he mentions in the book is, are we willing to give such warnings to our children today? Warning children about adultery. And it doesn't, it's this is not just limited to the forbidden woman. Now you've got forbidden, you've got forbidden men. You had forbidden men back then. Um you think about especially now with the instantaneous communication we have everywhere. Everybody can go out there and reach everybody all the time right now. And you can do it all in private. So are we, are we willing as, you know, are, are you willing as parents? Are we willing as parents? Okay. We have, we have five children, five, five living children. I've got two grandchildren who are of adult age. Are we willing to talk to them about the fact that you guys be careful? <laughs> Don't assume that you're immune. Al, you've got to be careful out there in this world. You've got to be careful at work. You've got to be careful in your relationships with people. You've got to be careful in how you communicate electronically with people. If you think that you can just keep on communicating, and I've said it before, I know I said it last week, but I'll say it again. If you think you can keep communicating after you are married with people of the opposite sex who are not your wife in the same way that you communicated with them before you were married, you are being deceived. You can't do that. You can't. Now, I I mean, technically you can, but it's terribly unwise to do that because that's one way to build mistrust with your spouse is, oh, well, yeah, when, when, when she finds out that so-and-so was, was texting with this other woman at three o'clock in the morning for an hour and a half, well, what are you texting about? I, I think it, there's, there's a reasonable possibility you weren't, you weren't texting about the difference between infralapsarianism and supralapsarianism to go to a theological discussion. Um, because especially when somebody from the opposite sex who is not your wife starts pouring out their heart to you about very personal problems in a private setting, you, you have to be very, very careful in that setting. Um, so I, I, just, I, just, I just issue that admonition because we know that the history of the church is littered with people who thought it would never be me, and it turned out to be them. So just be careful. Okay. Any questions or comments here since I've done all the talking for the first 15, 20 minutes? Okay. I just think it's one, one quick thing. I think we need to realize that um, as you grow in the Lord and you get maturity and you understand God and you're growing and and righteousness being conformed to his image, that's going to be attractive to some members of the opposite sex. Because it's, it is. So just be, just be aware that just because, well, you think you're being overtly Christian when you are, but that's also going to be attractive to some people. Well, especially if somebody from the opposite sex is, let's say, married to somebody who is not very mature as a Christian. And then they see this other person of the opposite sex as, boy, I wish my spouse was like her, him, whomever. And, and, then, and then they start talking to this person whom they admire. And they start talking in private. And they start pouring out their heart about their problems with their spouse. And again, the history of God's people is, is, is littered with people who thought they could handle that kind of relationship. And it went bad. And to uh, the YouTube comment here, are Christians really dealing with this kind of thing like married couples? Absolutely. Um, Trust me, as as somebody who has has the white hair on my head to show how old I am, I I can vouch for this sort of thing. And as somebody who's who's only been an elder here for three plus years, um, we have had to deal with that kind of stuff within our church, sadly enough. And as, as churches go, our church is not that big, 300 plus people. Um, but yes, these are realities in the lives of Christians. You, you look at the reality of, of the relationship that, you know, and we found out later on that there was a whole lot more wrong with him 
that that Ravi Zacharias got hung up in while Ravi Zacharias was alive. Um, you can you can you can look at um, um, a guy that I I really liked his preaching, Artazerdia. Artazerdia got into a relationship with one of his students out at the seminary in Oregon here. Um, what three, four, five years ago, and it turns out that was the second time that it happened. You know that that stuff does happen within the church, and and it's <laughs> it's 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 preventable. <laughs> it's preventable if we just if we just take a lot if you if we take preventive medicine, and and what is some of the preventive medicine? Well, like I've mentioned, okay, I know I know people <laughs> grow weary of me making sure that. Uh, I'm going to put my wife on all of my texts and, and as another person on emails, but I do it. Um, and it drives me crazy when you all who have Androids respond to the threads that we're both in and it only comes to me. <laughs> that drives me crazy because it's only coming from the female. I don't know why Android devices do that, but they do that. So then I respond in the group thread again where my wife is on there. But you think about, you know, at the workplace. Um, when I, when I first came here late in 2014, the annual conference for the software that I administer was in Florida, and they wanted me to send, they, my employer wanted to send me to Florida for this conference. Well, they also wanted to send um, uh, the woman who, who worked in a related department to this conference. And there's a problem there is that sending the two of us to Florida, to me, was problematic. Plus. I had actually read our employee handbook <laughs> for our business. And in the handbook, it said that a, ma a male and a female shall not travel together alone. So I went and pointed that, that element of our handbook out to management and management said, you know, you're right. And management did something that you're probably gonna find pretty surprising. Management said, we will pay for your wife to go to this conference. So. They ended up paying for my wife to go to the conference. Well, in the meantime, <laughs> um, in, in the meantime, actually, did that, I can't remember, did that year, did, did my wife go? Because it ended up, the lady ended up resigning and not going to the conference. I, th I don't think my, was it that year my wife went? It might've been the next year my wife ended up going because it ended up my boss, a man ended up going to the conference with me. But regardless, I, I take that I take that element of our employee handbook seriously enough where I've been asked to go out from our headquarters when I was working at headquarters, not working at home. I was asked to go one to one of our clinics with a nurse manager. And it's a I don't know, an eight mile drive. And she said, well, let's go. And I said, OK, let's go. You get in your vehicle and I'll get in mine. <laughs> um, I would not ride eight miles with a female nurse manager from our headquarters to this clinic and coming back, same thing, because we didn't have a third person in the vehicle. Now, one might say I am being overly cautious. And if, if that is your take on that, that's fine. But you know what? It, it, it's the best thing I can do to remain above reproach here. I don't have to respond to somebody making up an allegation about something that happened in that car or something that I said in that car because I wasn't even in the car. So I, I think that we can try and insist that that sort of thing not happen with our employer. And I think a lot of employers, especially in the current environment, they will be sympathetic to that sort of thing. So I think that sort of thing is just, is just, uh, an example of what we can try and do to, to put up safeguards, to put up fences, because we, we need to have certain, certain fences, certain barriers in our relationships with the opposite sex when the opposite sex is not our wife or not our husband. We just need to be careful. Um, so, all right, any questions or comments on that? Okay, now getting back to this uh, comment on YouTube about does this happen within the church? Again, since um, 
we have been around for a while. Let me give an example of what happens. There was in our little town in Northern Michigan that those who know what it is, know what it is, but I'm not gonna say what it is. So there was a church that was a pretty big church and they had a worship team. Now, now we all know at Grace Community Church, our worship team consists of Jenny. <laughs> But they had a worship team. They had the singers, they had the keyboards, they had the guitar players, they had the whole band thing. Over time, one of the singers and one of the guitar players, both of whom were married, in all of these times of close interaction in their practice and practice and getting together outside church without their spouses, and with a little dissatisfaction in their own marriage became overly close and the overly closeness turned into an affair. The affair turns into divorce and it didn't go well for the marriages. It didn't go well for the church either to have two of their people on a worship team committing adultery with each other. That was not, that was not a good witness. The the woman involved, she and her husband were insurance clients of mine back in that day. And, and I found it a little odd one day when I stopped by to see them on business. And all of a sudden, she is dressing in a way that she had never dressed before. Let's just say that. It was not conservative. And then the truth comes out shortly thereafter. So um, that's why I say, don't think that you're immune. <laughs> Don't. And, and even, you know, people here who have white hair, we have to, we have to be careful because we are not immune as well. So, all right. Any comments on that? Okay. Now beyond just the mere act of adultery, we know, we know that scripture says it's not just the act that is adulterous. Jesus comes along in Matthew chapter 5 and tells us the desire to do something is as if you have committed the act. So we know that from what he says about adultery, he says, if you, if you have looked with lust, you have already, past tense, committed adultery. You've already done it. Now, just because there's a woman to see or a guy to see, the seeing is not adultery. The seeing is the temptation to lust and commit adultery. Because you can see somebody of the opposite sex and not necessarily lust after them. Not, and and there's, a, there, there's another book I've got here on another ethical book that goes into a lengthy discussion of what lust is. And, and that, that may be a discussion for another day and another time. But you think about what lust is. Lust in, in, in this particular context is a desire for unlawful, sinful sexual contact with somebody, sexual relations with somebody. So Jesus comes along and says, it's not merely the physical act that becomes adultery. He says the desire to commit adultery is adultery itself as well. And he raises that bar so much. Because remember what I said earlier when I quoted about the things that come out of the heart, that's the problem. It's not washing your hands that's the problem. It's, think, it's that which comes out of the heart is the problem. And the desire to commit adultery is something that is an action of the heart. So we can apply that to uh, beyond adultery to all sorts of things, you know, to any sin, you know, the desire to... <laughs> That we, Jesus, scripture goes there with this issue of hating your brother. If you hate your brother, it's, it's, you are a murderer. Now, you didn't physically kill him, but murder is equated with hatred of your brother in scripture. So this, this is the thing Proverbs 6.25 says about this, uh, this attitude that the man is supposed to have towards somebody who's not their wife. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. You know, men, husbands, don't desire the beauty of another woman in here. Women don't desire the beauty of another man in here. Um, 
I'll even go so far as singles. Don't desire fornication in here. Because the desire to fornicate is just as if it's it's just as if you have already committed it, according to Jesus. So um, you know, this whole issue of of of, of looking and lusting. And uh, I, I, I want to give you an example of something I thought was preposterous in 1997, and I still think it's preposterous to this day. The very first weekend evangelistically I spent inside Ken Ross Correctional Facility in Kinchlow, Michigan, I had a guy sit right next to me here. He was doing life. He'd already been in over 20 years. And the discussion at the table one time came around to this issue of watching movies. Prisoners in Michigan, if they can afford it, they can buy a little, back in the day, they could buy a little 13 inch transparent black and white TV and hook it up to the cable system that the prisoners paid for and watch movies. Okay. Well, this guy would maintain as a, as a Christian guy sitting right here. And he was telling the other seven prisoners at the table and the other two volunteers, he was telling us all that he can watch movies with naked women in them and not lust at all. He said, I've never lusted, not once, looking at, at this, these movies with naked women in them. I, I think the, the response from the guys at the table, as, as volunteers, we didn't have to say anything. The guys at the table took care of that. They said, <laughs> you know, they, 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 they called, <laughs> they called baloney on that, <laughs> except they didn't say baloney. Okay. I, I think the guy, the guy was deceived. I think I thought, I thought he, I mean, I thought he was deceived in 1997 and 25 years later, I still think he's deceived because he is a man. He's, he was not a homosexual. He was a heterosexual man and he is in prison for life. He's not getting out so he can go out and have relations with another woman for the rest of his life, most likely. And he's going to look at naked women in movies, and he says he's not going to lust after them. Baloney. Um, I think he had, he had too high of an opinion of himself, is what he had. That he thought he could expose himself to all of this temptation in, in its most graphic format, and it would not and could not affect him. I think he was setting himself up for a fall. And I think the, the lesson to be learned from that is, is that we want to make sure that we don't set ourselves up for falls in things like this, because we still have to understand that our hearts are not yet glorified. We still have this capacity to sin in this life. And we don't want to tee ourselves up and put ourselves in a situation, and I know our context here is adultery, as husbands and as wives, where we're, we're setting ourselves up for a fall. We don't want to entertain the serpent coming and talking to us in the garden sort of thing. Because Adam let the serpent in. Adam was supposed to protect the garden. Adam was the protector of the garden. He should have been the protector of his wife. But it didn't happen. And we see what happened and we're living with the consequences of it today. Okay, question or comment? Um, one guy was talking about, he's an evangelist and he said he went to a church one time and it was raining. He got to the early and there was a woman, someone had dropped off and she was standing there outside the church was locked. And somebody said, well, did you let her in the car with you? He said, no. He said, I got out of the car and stood in the rain and let her sit in the car. So he's being a gentleman to let her in the car, but he wasn't going to be in there with her. Well, and, and to be, to be. You know, to give a real life example, and all three parties involved are here on the study. When our when our sister Jacinda lived with us for uh, a period during her last year of college, the only time I was alone was when with her was when she stopped by when she didn't think I was going to be here, and she was here for ten minutes, and I went outside on the deck for ten minutes while she was here stopping in getting something, and then I and then when she. When, when she left, I came back in the house and she knew the rules. Okay. She didn't think I was going to be, I was, I was going to be here at that time, but we, we always made sure that if, if my wife was going somewhere and Jacinda was going to be here, I exited stage, right. 
that sort of thing. Um, just because we don't need that kind of talk going around the church. We just don't. Uh, you know, even if nothing would have happened if we would have been here together, you don't you don't want to set things up where people say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure nothing happened. No, we were we were extremely abundantly careful about that. And she honored our desire to be extremely abundantly careful during all those during those months that she was here. So but when you when you look at scripture and the standards, okay, that when when you say that uh, when you tell people you, you need to avoid all of this, that the born again Christian does have the ability to say no when temptation arises. But I think Grudem makes a very valid point on page 717. He says, some people reading this, especially non-Christians or younger Christians, may think that such teachings are simply impossible to follow. And what teachings? Don't lust. Don't look. Don't expose yourself to this sort of thing. I mean, we, we have had people in our church tell us it is unreasonable it is unreasonable to expect over time young men to not look at pornography. I mean, Tim, Tim had a discussion with a young guy who was not from our church, has never attended our church. But, but I th if the story goes right, when I remember Tim telling it, is that, is that Tim asked the guy, do you think it's reasonable to go six months, a guy your age, in your 20s? Remember, the, guy, the guy's never attended our church, so you can't figure out who it is. Okay. <laughs> but... He said, do you think it is reasonable for a guy your age to go six months without looking at porn? And the guy said, absolutely not. That's not reasonable at all. Now, wait a minute here. <laughs> Don't we have the same spirit that changed the world at Pentecost, who equips, who equips and empowers and enables God's people to say no to sin? Um, I, I mean, that sort, that sort of mindset is crazy. If you believe that it's impossible to go six months without looking at porn. Well, yeah, then you're not going to go six months looking at porn. And it's, and, and, and sadly enough, it's the same thing with women. It's not just, it's not just a male thing, but this, this, this goes to what do you believe about the doctrine of regeneration? What happens when you were born again? Weren't you given the power, the ability to say, no, you were given the authority to, to, to say no to the devil, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You're empowered to do that. And we can do it. And we, we're, we're charged with doing that. And to say, nah, well, I'm going to sin anyway. No, that's a very, that fatalistic attitude. If you, if you adopt a fatalistic attitude that, yeah, I'm going to sin anyway, I tell you what, yeah, you are going to sin. Um, and Scripture doesn't talk like that. Scripture has this expectation that God's people can say no to sin. And, okay, Noah just quotes Matthew 5.29, right after what Jesus has been talking about, about adultery. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Now, we know that some people deal with certain things in certain ways. They think that if they get rid of their smartphone and just go to a flip phone, Okay, their whole deal, their whole idea with with sexual impurity, their whole problem is gone. Well, no, <laughs> not necessarily. It, it's like the whole monastic lifestyle of the Roman Catholic monks that if they separate themselves from all things of the world, then they will not sin. Well, we know, or or if we or if we say, like Roman Catholicism has said in one of its doctrines of demons, Roman Catholic priests shall not get married. They shall, they shall have, they shall take a vow of celibacy. We know how that has turned out over time because all that does, it ends up causing more sin, not preventing sin. You look at the monastic lifestyle, whether it's the monks or whether it's the, um, the women who are, who are cloistered, you see all manner of sin because unbiblical ideas about separating from the world you think that if you just go live on a mountaintop in a rock castle and sleep on a stone floor, you're not going to have wicked thoughts. It doesn't work like that. It's not just the, it's not just the external. It has to come from the internal as a work of the spirit. All right. A question or comment? Okay. 
Okay, now page 718. I've been asked this question many times. <laughs> I want you to answer before I answer. Why did God allow polygamy in the Old Testament? Is it to care for the women because they needed protection? They needed someone to answer for them? Well, okay. By the time of Solomon's day, did, did 300 women need protection? From Solomon. Probably. <laughs> um, be, because when you when, when you it, it didn't take long for polygamy to happen. Okay. Um, sc does scripture ever say why he allowed it? It really, it really, it really doesn't say why he allowed it. It just says that he did. Now, there were admonitions against it, weren't there? Yes. Was the king to have, yeah, was a king to have many wives? No. no. Uh, we don't see uh, the, the, the vast preponderance, if, if not almost all of the examples we have in the Old Testament of those who took multiple wives. And you'll notice it's always men taking multiple wives. It's not women taking multiple husbands. We, we wait until John 4 for that. But in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, we have these guys taking multiple wives. And do, does it work out well when they do that? Not usually. Now, I know that this, <laughs> forgive me if this is chauvinistic, but can you imagine two women being jealous of each other or one woman being jealous of another woman? Can you imagine that? Um, we, we see, we see one example is first um, Samuel one. Okay. Elkanah has two wives, right? One of them is Hannah. Hannah is childless. How kind is Elkanah's other wife toward Hannah? Yeah, they 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 can't hear your 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 hand motions, Jim. Vicious, vicious, vicious. Right, trash talking. Okay, because because the the other wife whose name escapes me, where's she even named? I can't remember. I'm having a bad day. Um. Anyway, she's got children, and Hannah doesn't, and she is not very understanding with, um. Hannah's childlessness and Hannah prays and we know how the story turns out. But the point is, is that there were issues between the women. We've got issues here between Rachel and Leah. We know this. We've got issues. Okay. With Sarah and Hagar. Now was, was Hagar technically a wife? Well, that, 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 that's another issue. Um, he, he, she, she sure treated Sarah, Sarah, Sarah wanted Abraham to treat her like a wife. Um, and you just don't see polygamy working out well. It didn't work out well for Solomon. And you could say, well, that's because Solomon married all these foreign wives. Well, yeah, but I don't think it would have worked out well if all of these wives and concubines that, that Solomon had would have been, would have gone any better. So, but, but scripture does just, it just states the fact that these guys had multiple wives. Penina, that's her name, right? Okay. But you got Deuteronomy 21, 15. If a man has two wives, it's an assumption that, that a man may have two wives. It doesn't say he's wrong in having two wives. It just states that he has two wives. That, that Gideon had many wives, Judges 8. We've got 1 Samuel 1 with Elkanah having two wives. David had multiple wives. Um, 
First Kings 11, verse 3, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Um, why did God allow it? <laughs> it's, it's interesting that really scripture doesn't say, as far as I know, why he allowed it, just that he did allow it, even though it resulted in, in situations which, which were not really helpful within, within the marriages. Um, but he, he did. Now, even though he did in the old, does he in the new? No. There's Jesus in his, right. Jesus in his teaching on marriage, okay, gets, gets to the heart of the matter. Um, because Jesus does teach on marriage and he does, he does say one husband, wife. You, you don't see anywhere in the New Testament any sort of teaching about husbands having wives. It's about a husband having a wife. And the, the example that we have of a woman having multiple husbands, now we don't know the woman at the well, why she had five husbands. We don't know how many died. We don't know how many divorced. All that we know is that she had five husbands before she ran into Jesus. And the guy she was living with at the time was not her husband. But that question about why did God allow it? I don't know, but he did. For that season, he did. Now, did he allow this so that the nation of Israel could multiply, so that the men could have many wives, and many wives meant many children? Could be. Um, but we know that those days are gone. We don't live under the old covenant anymore. We live under the new. And in the new, Jesus and the rest of the New Testament is quite clear that a husband has a wife, and that's it. Okay. Anything on that before we move on? Um, here's where I think Spanish is one of the most brilliant languages on the planet. Uh, what's the word for wife in Spanish? Esposa. What's that word mean in plural form? Mean or say? Well, the plural form, isn't that handcuffs? I don't so, know. So if you go home, if you go home to two wives, you're handcuffed. <laughs> That's, those are those who speak Spanish. What is what is supposed to mean in the plural? <laughs> I don't know. Do we have any Spanish speakers? Okay, we got one on is, is Sada E still on YouTube? Okay. Help a brother out here if you're on YouTube. <laughs> Sadie speaks Spanish. <laughs> I don't know. She might have gotten off. Okay, Nancy. Okay, Nancy, help us out here. <laughs> Plural of esposa. Okay. All right. Well, we'll wait for that. Okay. okay. I guess we're going to have to resolve that on Sunday. My mom knows okay. Spanish. You should ask my mom. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, but I don't see your mom here, Ishara. Oh, I see her. Never mind. Ishara is teaching Spanish this semester, so she should actually know. Ah, okay. Yeah, Sada E says, yes, it does mean that. Yes, it does mean handcuffs. Okay. All right. Mark. Okay. I, I thank our sister for the Spanish lesson, aff affirming our brother here. Okay. Um, just because I know it's the word for spouses doesn't mean I know much beyond that. <laughs> My two years of high school Spanish did not fare well. So, <laughs> all right. So it does. Okay. Now, you know, after that, after that chuckle, uh, the, the book goes to, uh, far more serious matters now about sexual practices prohibited in scripture. Okay. And this is why I had the email sent out. And this is why I had the disclaimer on the chat here on YouTube, because we're going to talk about some things that some parents are uncomfortable if their children happen to hear about them. Um, scripture does say no to certain things. It just does. And one of the things that we know scripture says no to concerning sexual activity is the issue of incest. Let's go to Leviticus 18. Let's go to Leviticus 18.
Leviticus 18, let's start verse 6. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncovered nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or of your daughter's daughter, for their nakedness is your own nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter brought up in your father's family, since she is your sister. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. She is your father's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is your mother's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. That is, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, and you shall not take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. They are relatives. It is depravity. And you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. Okay. Commentators are pretty much in agreement that that phrase that you keep seeing throughout that passage of uncovering nakedness is a euphemism for sexual relations. So that passage gives this laundry list of, of, of people that thou shalt not have sexual relations with. Uh, you've got, you can go, you've got mother, stepmother, sister, or stepsister, granddaughter, aunt, daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, stepdaughter, step-granddaughter. Um, you, you're not supposed to marry your stepmother, Deuteronomy 22, 30. Um, the, the prohibition against incest is, is rather explicit there. And we know that that manifested in the New Testament, Right. 1 Corinthians 5. Um, and yes, Joel, you're right. This, that same verbiage appears when you go back to Noah and, <laughs> and Noah's nakedness. Um, and you, you can read some interesting discussions in an academic sense about what they think happened with Noah and his son that ended up with the curse being called out subsequent to that. But this issue of you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife in verse eight of Leviticus 18. We know that that manifested in first Corinthians five, as Paul gives us that passage on why the Corinthians wondering why the Corinthians had not removed the guy from the church because he was, he was sleeping with his stepmother and he calls them arrogant for not having done so already. They should have already done that because he considers that leaven within, within the, the dough of the Corinthian church using that Old Testament imagery and leaving the guy there was not loving to Paul. It was arrogant and it was not for the be betterment of the man's soul to leave him there either because Paul says the thing that you should have done was you should have cast him out, turned him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that he might be saved in the day of the Lord. But the point is, is that incest is something which is prohibited. Now, you may have a question, though. Let's go back to the very beginning of our Bibles and Genesis chapter 4. Where did Cain's wife come from? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. They came from his mother. Well, how can that happen if incest is prohibited? It indeed was not prohibited at that time, was it? That if if the command to be fruitful and multiply was going to be carried out, people had to be fruitful and multiply. And the only people 
let's be let's be honest. The only people you had there were Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel for a while, and any other children produced by Adam and Eve. Right, and exactly, they were the only humans there. So it was not prohibited then. And therefore, it was not against the law then. But we know that with the giving of the law, here in the law, that that incest does become an issue. And Paul, Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 says, it's not just a matter of the law that, that Israel knows about. Paul says even the pagans know it's wrong. That's, that's the degree to which he speaks against incest there. So, yes, incest, incest is sin. Now, I know that you may wonder about, are we going to talk about homosexuality? Yes, but not tonight, because there's a whole other chapter on that. We will get there. All right. The law came after Adam and Eve sinned, right? Well, when did the law come? Okay, somebody answer our sister's question. Now, we, we, have to, we have to go to, let's define, okay, Jackie, let's define the law. Um, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> it's your question. Okay, um... Okay. Um, oh, I have it in my mind, but I don't know how to express it. Um, hold on. Well, let me let me take a wild guess while you're considering. When, when we talk about the law, typically, not always, typically, though, we're talking about that which was given to Israel at Sinai. Not just the Ten Commandments, but all those other things that flowed out of that, like the teaching on divorce that we know that Jesus said, you guys all know about, but I'm saying it ain't going to be that way anymore. That but it's, it's the law given to Israel at Sinai. And, and that law was given for a purpose. It was given to a people. But there were certain standards that even though they hadn't been given to people, that God still held people to. And we know that God was not really pleased with the sexual practices of the Canaanites and all the other ites out there, but they hadn't been given the law. But that goes back to the issue of creation. <clears throat> that creation talks about one man, one woman. God ordained sexual relations are to happen between man and woman, husband and wife, and that's it. And if the Canaanites were engaging in sexual practices, which were other than that, they are really violating that which God made at creation. It goes back to Romans 1, where Paul writes against people who are acting against nature in their sexual relations. Um, Okay, so you're thinking about you can't do this and you can't do that. Yeah, and, and, and that's not necessarily bad, but I think when we think about the law as a body, the law as a unit, we tend to think about that which was given to Israel at Sinai because we, we know that there, there were other things stated before that. Um, there, there was one law given to Adam and Eve, don't eat from that tree, um, and they did, so... But, but the issue here is, is that uh, um, th this whole issue of sexual behavior, God, God clearly expected even people who didn't have the law at Sinai to abide by nature as it was at creation with regard to sexual relations, that it was husband and wife, man and woman, and that's it. Um, and these other nations didn't do that. And because this is going to go probably into the next section that he talks about in the book. And this is, this is this issue of having sex before marriage. Now, our culture certainly has changed in my lifetime 
that when I was in high school and uh, growing up uh, before that in the 60s, that that it, you know, men and women just didn't live with each other before marriage as a rule. Now, you, of course, there were exceptions. Um, when the sexual revolution hit during the, during the mid and late 60s, okay, that started changing. And, and then we, we know where we are sitting now here 55 years later. But, but this issue of, you know, even having sex before marriage, it was <laughs> living in sin when I was growing up. You know, it's interesting. Naomi says that. Okay. And I got kids older than Naomi. Okay. Um, but <laughs> so even, even then, um, uh, you know, yes, when, when, a, when a guy and a girl would, would, would start living together, yes, it was called living in sin. Um, and everybody knew that. Everybody called it that. Not, not just Christians called that. that the culture called it, called it that back then. I but, it. Yeah. So the, the, the thing is here is that, is that scripture does not endorse sexual behavior before marriage. It just doesn't. Now, I, I don't want to spend time on this, but there is, a, there is a teaching out there that says that as long as you're betrothed, you can, there are two, two strains of this teaching, that you can have sexual relation, you can have sexual intercourse while you're betrothed because of the way they look at Deuteronomy 20, verse 7, or there's another teaching out there that says you can have all manner of sexual contact and sexual relations just as long as it's not sexual intercourse before your marriage, as long as you are betrothed. Now, I, th I think scripture doesn't speak that way. Scripture talks about sexual activity in the context of marriage. And to try and dance around that by saying that you can have all manner of sexual contact as long as it's not genital to genital intercourse, it's okay as long as you're betrothed. I don't think scripture speaks like that, okay? Because scripture says is that, is that sexual contact, sexual relations are to be in the context of marriage and marriage alone. Anything else is sin. Whether you want to call it, you know, adulterous, if you have a married person involved, whether you want to call it fornication, when, when you have two single people involved, and it doesn't matter whether it is genital to genital intercourse or all of the other kinds of sexual acts that you can imagine that are out there and that people do, just because you're betrothed, you have license to do that. No, you're, I think you're reading Deuteronomy 20 verse 7 wrong about the guy who's who's given an exemption from going to war because he's betrothed. That's not what the passage is talking about. The, the passage is not giving the guy license to go home and have sex with his betrothed. It's giving the guy license to go back to his woman. Now, I think if you take the entirety of scripture into, into account, that the guy is to go back and, hey, why not get married because he's betrothed, okay? And then you have, then you have your sexual relations. But scripture does not anywhere give, give room, give license, give wiggle room for sexual relations before marriage. And I know people try and get around that by saying, as long as it's not genital to genital, it's okay. No, it's not, because it is still at the end of the day, sex in one form or another. Um, and, and I think you can, you can, you can read ancient cultures and ancient history and see the sort of sexual things that people did and the things that people were doing in Paul's day in Corinth and in Athens. And it's crazy. And in Rome, under the guise of, well, it's all okay. Well, no, it's not all okay. God designed man and woman in a certain way, complementary. They complement each other. He designed man and woman naturally man has certain parts a woman has certain parts he designed them to be used in a certain way he designed them to have a certain act in a certain way and that's god's way and he says it all happens in the answer in the course of marriage not in the course of betrothal or engagement um 
All right, a question or comment before I before I move on further with this. I've always thought that those other ways of which you know people have called sex, which are not you know as you describe, um, that they must have come from the homosexuals because that's how homosexuals do one another. Well, there's there's that act, and there are all manner of sexual acts out there that um, that that people over history have been punished for, Frank. And people will find crazy ways to gratify themselves. Let's just say that. Um, and and we're going to get to that. I hope with some sensitivity here in a few minutes. But yeah, you know, with regard to homosexuality, the one thing that the one thing that that we can stand on is the fact that homosexuality is a violation of nature. Yes. This is this is where you go. This is the way God made it. This is the way that 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 male and female are. They are created naturally to to be joined in union sexually in one manner. That's what the, that's one purpose of the parts of the guy parts and the lady parts. We know they have other function, um, but um, okay, okay, Ijara and Sadi, I'll get to your question because I was going to address that anyway. All right, don't don't let me forget. Okay, I can see the, the Zoom chat easier over here, so Ijara needs to be my reminder. Um, but. The, the fact that people want to say, well, if it's, if it's not genital to genital, it's okay. No, it's not. Um, you know, choose, choose how people want to, want to gratify themselves or, or, or help somebody else in gratification. You, 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 you have to be, you have to look at scripture and why is, why did God, you know, God made your sexual organs for sex in addition to other purposes, but he made your sexual organs for sex. And he made your sexual organs to make sexual relations pleasurable for man and woman. And that's the way nature is. And scripture doesn't let you go outside that and say, well, it's okay. It just doesn't. Um, that's the way, that's the way that God has made male and female. And we even know that in, okay, you can see that even in the animal world. Okay, you've got male, male animals and female animals. And they have sex naturally. They mate. That's what they do. And the same principle applies with male and female, um, with, with God's image bearers. So, um, and we know that this imagery, again, is applicable to Christ and his church. That it's one way. You don't get options, and you can't go outside the bounds in the relationship between Christ and his church. And God wants mankind to not go outside the bounds that he has set for nature here either. Now, that leads us into page 723 and our sister's question. Can you kiss before marriage? I have my answer. I will give my answer in a minute, but I want an answer from the assembled multitude here. Well, I'm not sure that this actually has anything to do with men and women kissing, but the Bible says in several places that Christians were to greet one another with an holy kiss. Um, okay. It, it does. Now, I think, Frank, that we would also probably agree that the holy kiss that Paul might have greeted Barnabas with was not probably the same kiss that Peter might have given his wife or that um, in Genesis 26, when it says Isaac and Rebecca were laughing and uh, that laughing there is a euphemism for, I, I think your, your scholars will all agree on it, that they were making out, to use the term from my day, that, um, you know, the, the kiss that you may give your uh, 
uh, your helpmate, Mary, would probably be a different kiss than you might give me if you're giving me a holy kiss. I think that our sister's question is about a male-female kiss in the sense of a romantic relationship, in the sense of, I think it's talking about here in the timing of engagement. So let's, let's go, let's make, let's narrow this down, okay? I think, our, I think our sister's question is, if you have male and female who are engaged or male and female who are considering engagement, okay, whatever level that looks like, the question is, is it okay for them to kiss as male and female? I didn't want to get on the mic because I knew you'd pick on me if I said something. <laughs> <laughs> I would never do that, brother. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think that he, here we go is, can, can we go to chapter and verse that's going to give dogmatic universal law applicable to all of God's people for all of God's time? I don't oh. think we can. Okay, yeah, I don't think we can. Now, I think we can uh, apply some principles here, and I know some of this gets into personal preference or lack thereof. Now, we have our, our, our brethren from the great state of Michigan who say no. <laughs> we have our, our brother from Massachusetts who is uh, uh, <laughs> taken, he's not taking the fifth, he just won't comment. Um, now here, here's, here's what I counsel. Okay. I'm just trying to make sure I haven't missed anything. Sorry. Okay. Um, can, can a male and a female do that? Yes, they can, but whether they should is another matter. I counsel people to wait until you may kiss the bride. Now, why do I say that? I say that because I thought I saw a comment here which was going to give me my answer. Yes, okay, Ijara said it. Because men and women, when they kiss, they will agree it's a good thing. Okay, let's, let's be honest here. Let's be frank. It is a pleasurable sensation. And when male and female are not yet husband and wife, it can lead to places where they ought not go. Now, will it necessarily lead to places where they ought not go? No, I'm not going to say that. But I can say this, far too often it does lead to places where they, they know they ought not go. And it doesn't necessarily always lead to actually having sexual relations before they get married, but it can lead them to the point of lust where they sure want to have sexual relations, <laughs> but they manage to stop themselves. But the desire to have the sexual relations is as if you've already had the sexual relations. We go back to Matthew 5. So my counsel to, to couples as they are talking to me during marriage counseling my, my advice is, I, it's not a command, it's advice, nothing more than advice. My advice is wait, <clears throat> because I think there's something to this, you may now kiss the bride phrase. Mm. When that happens, that should be a big deal. Because you're doing that in a public setting. And, it's the, and, and if it's the first time you've done it, and, and people have this sense of knowing that it's the first time you've done it, they know that now this relationship is at a different level and a different place than it was before those two people walked in the door. I think there's wisdom in not kissing before marriage because of the, the not giving the devil a foothold. Because again, you've got this issue is that once men and women start kissing, men and women like it. 
and it's not wrong. <laughs> it, it's not, you know, God made that to be, God made our lips in a certain way and, and men and women like it. And there are certain things that we ought to avoid if they're going to cause us to sin. Um, and I just think that far too often, again, people think that, well, we can handle this. Okay, we can kiss, we can sit on the couch, and we can, it's, and it's not just a peck on the cheek, okay? Okay, it's, it's face to face, and they think that they can do that for a while and never go anywhere, either physically or in their heart, that they shouldn't go. Um, so I would, I, I would say my counsel is wait until that guy marrying you says you may now kiss the bride. And I mean, it's one couple that, that, that I told that to in our church and, and I did their wedding. Some of you were there that that part of the of the liturgy where you get down there and you say i now pronounce you man and wife and then the next thing that you say is something and then you say you may now kiss the bride well as soon as i said i now pronounce you man and wife he couldn't wait and he he lunged across there and gave her this big kiss and i mean she handled it pretty well but she wasn't expecting it i mean it was you know it was a good moment <laughs> but they'd been waiting for that and you could see by what he did that they had been waiting for that. And it was, it was a neat moment to see that. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my take on the matter, Sari. Okay. Um, that's, and that's, that's what I tell people when I counsel. Again, I don't issue it as a command. I say, I think, I think it's wise. And I think you will not regret doing it if you follow the advice. So, all right, a question or comment on that? Free, I also uh, don't believe in long engagements. You don't believe in long engagements? No, sir. Well, here you go. This is the thing. Does scripture say how long they're supposed to be? I don't know. <laughs> Just long <laughs> enough, right? <laughs> Just long enough. Now, some people, I know some some of the people that from GCC um, have gotten married within just a few months of uh, of starting the process. I know there's what there was another couple that those of us have been around for a while. They were engaged for I don't know what three four years before they got married. Now, again, here, what's right? I I, I think we have to be careful in our dogmatism about. Well, it's it's too early for you to get married if you've only been seeing each other three months. Okay, three months is too soon. Well, I, I think that throughout you know throughout church history, a lot of people have a lot of Christians have gotten married after much shorter engagements than that, and had wonderful marriages. Just because you have a lo a, a longer engagement does not necessarily guarantee a good marriage. And and to go back to our um, to our brother's Noah, our brother Noah's desire for the arranged marriage club. Now that's a joke. Okay. That's a joke. <laughs> you know, so, you know, arranged marriages and, and I, I can't remember where it is in the book. I don't know if it was in Grudem's book or not. It's interesting. I think Grudem said it in his book. Gr Grudem, Grudem said, there's no qualification in scripture that you have to love your spouse before you marry them. Now that sounds crazy, doesn't it? But think about it. Does scripture ever say that man and woman must love each other prior to getting married? That that is a qualification for marriage? It, it doesn't. It, it just doesn't say that. So, um, but you know, that's, that's getting a little bit off topic here because the, the issue is the issue that we're really talking about is, is being careful with regard to sexual contact before marriage. You know, you, you've, you've got to be careful because cer certain things trigger certain people in different ways. Um, I'll be, I'll be honest and, and vulnerable here when, when we used to come out of the prison on Saturday night, 
Okay, we would walk in the, back in the day when we stayed in the Michigan Department of Corrections Training Center. Um, we would walk, park our cars, go into the training center, and a bunch of the wives of the men who had been volunteering would prepare this sumptuous meal for us after we'd been in there eating prison food for a couple of days. And, and they would have this reception line, and the reception line involved the women hugging the men. Okay. Not side hugs, full front hugs. Okay. Now, after several years, I got real uncomfortable with that. Okay. Um, why did I get uncomfortable with that? To be honest, hugging a woman front to front feels real good. I'm just being honest. And I came to the point where I said, I can't do this anymore. And then, and, and I'm the chairman of the ministry. And I told them, I'm not going through the line anymore. Okay. Because I, I can't do this anymore as a matter of my own conscience. I, I will hug my wife. I will hug my daughters, but I'm not going to hug you guys like this. Well, it wasn't taken very well by some people, but I, uh, and then, and then I gave a, a talk at a, at a women's version of that outside. And I told the women that story. And one woman wanted to talk to me because she was highly offended that I said, I would not front hug women who weren't my wife. And I said, we got to understand here. This is a right hand that I had to cut off in my life because it was not leading me into a good place. And well, okay. Well, she finally got it. Um, but but the point is here is that we have to, we can never forget that, that men are men and women are women. And, and thank you, Lord, that men are men and women are women. But when men and women have physical contact, things can happen in people's minds. So we just have to be careful. All right, Charles, you were going to say something a few minutes ago. I was already put in the chat. I, I can't say it's really that pertinent to say at the moment. Okay. All right. So, all right. Anything else on this issue of contact before marriage? But, you know, I, 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 I think you have to, you, you know, those of you who end up getting, getting engaged or however you want to categorize that. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Sada E, it was, it was a big deal when I came to San Antonio and I told people that at best I will side hug people, but for a while I just shook hands with women at, at GCC because I wasn't even a side hugger um, when I got here. Um, I, I, I'm okay with side hugging now, but I really, really don't want to front hug. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't want to front hug you if you're not my wife. Okay. It's nothing personal. The issues with me, it's not with you. Okay. But, but this whole issue of, you know, you, you just think about sitting next to somebody. Okay. Guy and girl. Okay. You sit next to each other, you get real close, you put your arm around her, okay? She likes it, you like it. Are your thoughts always virtuous at that point? Well, you're going to have to make that decision. So and and if they're going to lead you somewhere where you know they shouldn't go, then that's a right hand that you're going to have to cut off. Um be, because I I think we just have to understand again that that men are men and women are women and Men and women have certain things that happen when physical contact happens. Okay. All right. Anything else before we move on? I think we might get through this tonight. Okay. Now, the next one is a sensitive issue. All right. This is the issue of masturbation. Now, Grudem has in this book two views on the matter. He has a, there's a view that says that masturbation is always wrong. And then there's another view that says masturbation is sometimes wrong. Grudem's view is, is that it is sometimes wrong. I, I am of the mind, it's always wrong. I think his reasoning and I'll say why I think his reasoning is bad reasoning in a few minutes. But he had another guy write the section in the book on the masturbation is always wrong. 
view. And, he, and, and we're talking about not just for single people, he's talking about married people as well. Okay. Jason Derushi wrote the masturbation is always wrong view. Jason Derushi at the time was teaching at Bethlehem Seminary in Minneapolis, the one seminary founded by John Piper and John Piper's church. Now Jason Derushi teaches at um, Midwestern Baptist Seminary in Kansas City. But Jason Derushi wrote the part in the book about masturbation always being wrong. Now, when you have that view, as I do, why do we have this view? Well, let's think about, and, and again, I know we're getting into some explicit issues here. Okay. Okay. leticia has got a question about who we can and can't marry. Okay. I'm going to have to scroll back up. Remind me to try and answer that before we, before we get into, into the end here. Okay. Um, cause I can't see it anymore and I'd have to scroll up and take too long to fish it out of the chat here. But the, the masturbation is always wrong principle. Why would we say that? Well, let's, let's be, let's again, be frank. Masturbation is a form of sexual gratification. You, you're, you're not going to, um, you're not going to get around that, um, why, why do men and women look at porn? Okay, they're, let's be honest. They're just not looking at porn for the fun of it. They're looking at porn for sexual stimulation. And, and many times the sexual stimulation results in them wanting sexual gratification. Okay, and they will take care of the matter if you get my drift. Well, I think scripture talks about sexual relation. Let's think about, does scripture ever endorse sexual behavior? outside the context of marriage. It does not. It just doesn't. Um, it, it always talks about sexual relations and, and masturbation is a form of sex. You can't, if you're going to say it isn't, you need to re-examine your thought on the matter <laughs> because it is a form of sexual gratification. It is a sexual act, whether you're male or female. Okay. Um, scripture talks about sex being in the context of marriage and sex being between male and female. It's something husbands and wives engage in. It's not something that a guy engages in by himself or a woman engages in by himself. And beyond that, where is the imagery of the intimacy between Christ and his church in the act of masturbation? It is not there. Okay. This, this man knowing woman is, is it's an intimate relationship. And part of man knowing woman is man having relations with woman. That's the knowledge that we talk about. That's it's, it's an intimate knowledge in an intimate relationship that when God tells Israel and Amos out of you, all the nations, only you, I have known, he's only had an intimate relationship with one nation. And when somebody is engaging in masturbation, where is the imagery there of any, any sort of comparison to the relationship between Christ and his church? It's just not there because it's not happening in a context with male and female. Um, this guy, uh, Darushi, if he, he has a longer article, by the way, on the Desiring God website, you can look it up if you want to, and I can put the link in, in our WhatsApp group later on. But I, again, I think, I think one of the fundamental things here is, is it doesn't, it, it just doesn't do justice to how the act of sexual relation between husband and wife is, is, is related to the, the oneness, the unity, the one flesh, and the relationship between God and his people. Plus the fact that I will go to 1 Corinthians 7. When scripture says, 1 Corinthians 7, it talks about people burning with passion, right? It does. And what is Paul's divinely inspired solution for burning with passion? It is not masturbation. 
is it? No, it is marriage. Now, think about it when, think about it, how often, now, I, I know somebody could have an objection to this too. How often are the desires that cause somebody to masturbate noble and godly desires? Uh, not very often, are they? No. Okay. That, that somebody sees somebody or somebody sees something on TV or you see this picture or you see this opposite sex person, you go, whoa. Okay. And then, and then you decide to gratify yourself based upon what you have seen. You are lusting after that person in one way or another. You really want to have relations with them, but you don't. So you end up having relations with yourself. And, and I just don't see scripture honoring that. Now, Grudem's view is this. And I was somewhat taken aback. I, I know that some people believe this, but, but he, his fundamental argument is this. It is not explicitly forbidden by scripture. Now, I think that's bad argumentation because if he's going to apply that argument to abortion, he now has no, no grounds to go and say that abortion is wrong either because scripture never says thou shalt not commit abortion, does it? It, it doesn't. We draw the, the prohibition against abortion from principles laid out elsewhere in scripture. Thou shalt not murder. Well, you have to establish that, that, a, that an unborn child being aborted is a murder first. Well, is an unborn child a human being who can be, uh, a human being, a person who can be murdered? Yes. So you draw principles and establish that abortion is wrong because it is in fact murder. Well, to say here that there's not a one chapter and verse that says, thou shalt not masturbate is bad reasoning, as far as I'm concerned, because we draw all sorts of principles from scripture, which are not explicitly there. We, we draw, we, based upon principle, we come to certain conclusions. It's just like the Trinity, okay? Do we have a verse that says, this is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? No, we draw conclusions from scripture here. But that, that's his first reason why it's okay. And I think that's bad reasoning myself. Okay. Now, he then goes here. He says, he says, he says, it is adding a law to scripture that isn't there. Well, I'm not convinced it's adding a law to scripture that isn't there. By that same reasoning is prohibiting abortion, adding a law to scripture, which is not there. I don't think that's the case with abortion. And I don't think that's the case here with, with masturbation. But his, his, his longest argument is based upon what Dr. James Dobson believes. Now, you all here, for the most part, are younger. Okay. Okay, Jackie, don't let me forget your question here. Okay. Um, actually, you've got two questions there. Let me, I'll try and remember to get to both of them. In, and I still got to get to Leticia's and I see Leticia join the Zoom here too. All right. Now, James Dobson in the 80s and 90s was the family advisor in the evangelical world. Focus on the family is and was this huge empire. Um, there to discipline. <clears throat> right. James Dobson was a psychologist, still is, a, I think he's still alive, if I'm not mistaken, he's pretty old, but he was a psychologist, and back in the 80s and 90s, for a dozen years, we attended the Church of the Nazarene, and James Dobson was a member of the Church of the Nazarene, and uh, Colorado Springs, where Focus and the Family ended up. Well, James Dobson brought a lot of psychological principles into his Christian counseling that looking back now here 30, 35 years later are not helpful. James Dobson is and was very much concerned about everybody's self-esteem. Okay. You didn't want to do anything that was going to harm somebody's self-esteem. And in what Dobson writes here about masturbation, 
Grudem picks up on this. Okay. Here's the, here's the justification for saying it's okay, especially among children, you know, children, teenagers, in that everybody does it. So it's okay. <laughs> and, and I'm reading this because Dobson says between 95 and 98% of all boys engage in this practice and the rest have been known to lie. It is as close to being a universal behavior as is likely to occur. Then Dobson warns against the spiritual danger of placing a moral burden on people that in his view, scripture does not support. He says this, boys and girls who labor under divine condemnation can gradually become convinced that even God couldn't love them. Now, just because you tell your child that you shouldn't masturbate, does that mean that you're damning your child? No, it's not damning your child anything more than telling your child, don't hit your sister or stop stealing the change off the top of my closet sort of thing. Um, okay, well, I, Bethany, I know Noah and Ezra have never lied. Okay, I just know that. Um, <laughs> but you think about it, okay? Every child lies. Well, is that okay that they lie then because they all lie? You don't want to condemn them and tell them that it's wrong to lie because that's going to harm their self-esteem or that's going to put them under, under condemnation. Um, I don't think so. You tell your child, you tell, you tell, you, you tell your daughter, stop punching your sister. Is that wrong? Because, because you've got, because all these children, okay, are always punching each other or they're stealing or they're lying all the time. Just because children do something doesn't mean that you shouldn't tell them it's wrong to do that. I think this is a, I think this is, I, to, be, to be honest, I think it's a ridiculous argument. All kids do it. You don't want to put kids under condemnation because all kids do something. Therefore, you don't tell kids to not do it. That's crazy. Are you so concerned about a, a child's self-esteem? or an adult's self-esteem, okay? If an adult is a habitual masturbator, okay? Well, you don't want to tell them that it's, 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 it's wrong. You really need to stop because it might harm his self-esteem or he might feel condemned because of it. Now, Jackie, I'll go to your one question here. Uh, let me get back to it if I can see it. All right, here, where is it here? Okay, is someone going to go to hell for it? Just for that one sin, well, you go to hell for all of your sin. <laughs> you, you go to hell for for a you go to your you go to hell for your sin of rejecting the Messiah. That's what people who are caught in their sin do. Now, some people manifest. Some people would be more known by one of those elements in First Corinthians six nine uh, six uh, verses nine and ten. Um, you know, is it sexual immorality? Yeah. The issue is not the sexual immorality. The issue is the rejection of Jesus Christ and them being lost still in their sin, which causes them to engage in habitual sexual immorality. The issue is the fact that they're not regenerate and they have rejected the Messiah. That's what damns people. Unbelief damns people, not a particular sin. It's like, it's like back in those cultures in the church of the Nazarene, if you were a smoker, oh man, you clearly were not going to heaven. There's just no, there was no doubt about it, that if you were a smoker, you were, you were going to go to hell because you already knew what hell smelled like, that sort of thing. Um, I, I don't think we want to say that, you know, it's, it's like with a homosexual. You're not, necess you're not trying to get the, the homosexual to become heterosexual. You're trying to get the homosexual to turn from all their sin and turn to Christ in faith. That's what you're trying to do. So to pick out one sin, I don't know if that is really super wise to do. Um, okay, now the next question is, how would that be wrong in marriage if the marriage bed is undefiled? Um, I, I think the reality is in a marriage, if if the husband or the wife is seeking their sexual gratification from themselves instead of their wife, that's going against God's design again. God has, I had a discussion with somebody, uh, with a couple last night. 
um, they brought up this podcast they were they were listening to, and and this woman on the podcast is taught teaching. I'm going to mess the phrase up. Forgive me. That that she has autonomy over her own body. Okay, in the marriage relationship, she has autonomy over her own body. Now I, okay. I know that sometimes I cannot be the most subtle guy out there. I said, her Bible must not have 1 Corinthians 7 in it. <laughs> because 1 Corinthians 7 says, no, she does not have autonomy over her own body. Now, I, I get that we have to be sensitive to our spouses, that, that, that there may be reasons why Okay, that every time one spouse wants to have relations, relations don't happen. You know, there's illness, there's, there's, there, you have to be sensitive there in the relationship. But, you know, in the bigger picture, in the whole, no, her body does not belong to her and his body does not belong to him, according to 1 Corinthians 7. It just doesn't. Um, and, and if, if one or the other spouse there, I'm just, you know, I'm thinking out loud. If one or the other spouse there is going to not find their sexual gratification in relationship with their spouse, that's not healthy, I don't think. Because it's really, it's, it's a subtle form of, I'm going to say it's a subtle form of adultery. Because for the guy, she is your sexual partner. You are not your own sexual partner in marriage. And for the woman, he is your sexual partner. You are not your own sexual partner. Um, I, I think that, that, that be, because again, you also have to think of what, what means is, is the masturbator in the marriage using to become sexually stimulated and then gratifying themselves, okay? Okay. Um, I don't think that those are always noble either. Um, yeah. uh, uh, Jackie, what, what if they both approve? I think over time, that would end up not working well, even if somebody has an idealistic mindset that it can work. I don't think it would go well over time because that's not the way God wants husband and wives to engage in their sexual gratification. The partner is supposed to be, again, you go back to the relationship between Christ and his church. That does not get mirrored in any way, shape, or form through the act of masturbation. It just doesn't. Um, so going back to going back to Grudem's argument here that, that it's okay, you know, it's interesting. He's he says it's okay. He he really only argues that it's okay using Dobson's argument, that's the, his argument is to go on for almost an entire page using James Dobson's argument here. Um, I think it's a bad argument. But then he goes and then he says, looking at a woman lustfully is forbidden by scripture. He says, even if scripture does not directly condemn masturbation, there is a danger that it can be accompanied by other sins such as wrongful lust. Exactly. That's the point. <laughs> That that and Jackie, that's where I think that's that's where that statement might lead, even if both approve today. Well, what about tomorrow? Because that can lead to it, it can lead, it can lead to what God doesn't want. God wants the spouse to be dependent upon their other, the you know, the other gender in their relationship in the marriage for their sexual gratification for their sexual release if if they don't need each other to satisfy the the natural again we go back to nature genesis 1 genesis 2 the natural be fruitful and multiply if they don't need each other for that is that really reflecting again the relationship between christ and his church does the church not need Christ? Well, if we're going to apply masturbation to the relationship between Christ and the church, no, the church doesn't need Christ for its satisfaction then. It can find satisfaction in itself. Okay. Um, 
All right. A question or comment, and I need to make sure I answer Letitia's question if I can, if I can find it. I'll try and find your question while anybody's making a comment here. I would have one question slash comment to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 8. Whenever it talks about, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the best of my understanding, if somebody is already burning with passion or like um, marrying for the intent of gratifying that desire, that is inappropriate, correct? Well, one would hope that one would get married for another reason other than just finding a sex partner. Okay. Um, but I, I think we would be hard pressed to say that when 1 Corinthians 7 talks about this, um, if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Again, I don't see Paul saying the solution to burning with passion is masturbation. It just isn't. Now, again, yeah, you want to be, because again, how are you going to love, love your wife as Christ loved the church if the only reason she is there is to be a sex partner? That's not the way the relationship is between Christ and his church, okay? It's a much more full-orbed relationship than just one very narrow focus here. Um, but, you know, and, and this, and this goes to another issue of, you know, if you're burning with passion and you are engaging in, in ongoing sex with yourself, okay, I, I want, you know, I want, you know, those of you who are single, I want you to think about this, you know, is that going to stop as soon as you say, I do, if you don't have self-control before you get married, what thinks, what makes you think you're going to have self-control after you get married? It's sort of like, it's sort of like the, uh, you know, the, the, the marrying an adulterer, okay? Somebody who enters into marriage with somebody who's cheating on their spouse. Well, the very foundation of your marriage is founded upon adultery. What makes you think that person's not going to be adulterous again or adulterous still just because they've said, I do. And far too often they continue being adulterous and the marriage founded upon adultery does not go well. So that's where I would be on that. Thank you for the explanation. That does clear up a okay. bit of confusion with that verse. Okay. All right. Our sister wants to know, can an individual marry their ex-in-law? Now, uh, Leticia, are you on Zoom now? Because I may have a question for you before I answer yeah. your question. All right. Okay. All right. So are you talking about a situation where Guy is married to, uh, let's say John is married to Sally. Okay. Sally has a sister named Jane. Okay. Uh, Sally dies. Okay. Can John marry Jane? Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I would say yes, because I don't see anything prohibiting it. Now, divorce makes it more complicated. If John and Sally are married and John and Sally get divorced, we're jumping ahead to the chapter on divorce because I really don't want to spend a lot of time on divorce given the fact that there's a whole chapter on it. But divorce would complicate my answer a little bit. But if, if, if Sally had died, can John marry Sally's surviving sister? I don't see anything now prohibiting that myself. That's just me. Okay. A comment on that for anybody else here? So, um, so if she, if she was alive and they were just divorced, could they, could he still marry the, the other one? Well, we're going to get there in the chapter on divorce. It depends upon the basis for the divorce. Um, and, and I know that there are differing opinions on that because... Let's say that John, John is committing adultery with the in-law. And then John and Sally get divorced. Does John have biblical license to marry Jane now, the one he was committing adultery with? In my mind, absolutely not. 
Okay. I don't think adultery should be rewarded with another marriage myself. Now, if, if Sally were the one committing adultery and John divorces Sally because Sally's committing adultery, I believe that John is now free to remarry and he can remarry and he can remarry whoever he wants to. If he's a Christian, he better marry another Christian. Okay. Now I know that we can have all sorts of scenarios that we can come up with and complicate the issue much more, but to, to make a blanket statement and say that you can never marry your ex-in-law, I don't think that would be a blanket statement. That would be a, a, a proper statement. Now, here you go, Letitia. John Piper would say in the event of, in, in the event of, <laughs> John Piper believes you only get married once, no matter what the circumstances are of your marriage ending. Doesn't matter. You get married once. That's it. Now, Piper would also say he was the only guy at his church when he was an elder there that had that thought. And I, and I don't want, I don't want to go there um, in detail but we will, we will deal with that in length on the chapter on divorce because Grudem deals with Piper's view. Um, Naomi, I think that he would allow it in the event of death, okay? But I think in the event of any divorce, there is never remarriage in Piper's view. He has a, a and he has an admittedly rather, rather narrow view on, on his permanence view of marriage. But I don't wanna get it wrong I can't remember exactly what the, the stipulations of Piper's. <laughs> why would he want to marry the sister? Well, why not, Jackie? Okay. <laughs> um, but, but as far as a blanket prohibition, I, I can't say that there's a blanket prohibition here with regard to that. Um, well, we're about out of time. We didn't get to the rest of the chapter. Um, maybe we'll revisit it someday. But uh, next week, Lord willing, Lord willing, we are going to be talking about birth control. How many of you here were raised in a Roman Catholic environment? Me. Okay. Just one? Wow. Okay. San Antonio, that's pretty impressive. I was yeah. also... Okay, Frank was okay. Now back in in Frank in my day, um, Roman Catholic views on certain issues were a little different than they are now. Um, with the outflow of Vatican II, Vatican II has pretty much re removed all the rules in Roman Catholicism altogether. Um, uh, um, but uh, Roman historic Roman Catholicism has a particular view on birth control. And it was quite strict. Um, so we will we will deal with with birth control next week, and we may get into reproductive technology and infertility too, um, because those are real issues that real people have to deal with. Now, do I have time to answer? Answer Tyrell's situation. Okay. <laughs> Okay, some of you in San Antonio are going to love this question. And I certainly am not going to be able to answer this one in two minutes, Tyrell. How do you find a spouse in a situation where there are scarcely persons to choose from? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> even in places where there are a lot of people, sometimes people have a problem finding a spouse. Um, Tyrell, ask around amongst the singles in our church. Okay. Just, they, they yeah, Jackie says it's scarce everywhere. Um, uh, you know, and, and we chuckle about it, but I know it's not funny to those people who are, who really desperately would like to be married and are not. Um, it's, it's just like, you know, joking around with, with, with women who desperately would like a child and don't have one because of infertility that that all all joking aside it's serious and it causes people it causes people to to fall into depression to fall into anxiety to fall into into all manner of things so um you know what do you do tyrell you pray 
you pray, and in the meantime, you trust God, you go about your life, you be a godly man, you obey God, and you focus on the things of God, and while you're waiting, while you're waiting, if you're focused on the things of God, the waiting won't seem so long. I'm not going to, I'm not going to doubt that the waiting may be long, but your perspective on its length might be different. If your attitude is that of, for now I'm single, I'm going to make the best of it and do what God wants me to do in the meantime. And you may wake up 10 years from now going, man, I've been single 10 more years and I, I re it really didn't bother me. Well, why didn't it bother you so much? Because your mind was not set on it all the time. But I, I, I get, I've had discussions with people. I get the challenge as much as I can get it, being a guy who's been married almost 40 years. Um, I, I see people's torment. I see their, their, their anxiety over it. I see their depression. I see them getting downcast over it. And, and we just can't deny it. Um, we, we just can't deny the reality of that in that some people who desire marriage don't have it. Um, you know, but if, if in the meantime, your focus is being on a godly man, or if you're female, a godly woman, and trusting God and trying to obey God, and yeah, it may be a while, but I think God will honor your dedication to him in the meantime. Um, I really do. So, all right. That's the answer to that. I, th I thank you for all your cooperation tonight. I, I, I hope at one level, at least it was a, a little bit helpful. You know, these are, these are real issues that we deal with. You know, we deal with marriage. We have to, we have to deal with sexual sin and sexual activity going on. And the, those of you who've been around a while at, at our church know that we've had to deal with it at a church level and, and, and things can get, you know, sad and all that sort of thing. But um, we just want to try in the meantime to, to, to obey God and, and, and not be people about whom Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, not do what I tell you to. Uh, we want to be people who call him a Lord, Lord, and do do what he tells us to. So, all right. Thank you all. Let's, let's pray. Father, hmm. Father, we do thank you for your many good gifts. Um, you have, you have given mankind, you have given male and female. The, the, the act of sex as something that's good. Father, I pray that we would be good stewards of it. I, I pray that we would all, all be obedient to what you have for your people, be they man and woman who are married, be they male and female who are single. Father, the, the, the people who are single, who may be burning with passion, Father, I pray that you would give them a spirit of self-control. I pray that you would direct their affections elsewhere. Uh, I, I pray that you would help them to obey, and I pray that you would help them to be at peace in, in, the, in the season in life and where you have them right now. Even as they may have, have desires for marriage, they may have desires for, for sexual relations, but, but Father, help them to wait well Help them to help them to be godly men and godly women in the meantime, and, and help them to have the days go by quickly while they are waiting. Father, I just I just ask for help for your people. We we have not yet arrived. We are not home yet. We still have a few more rolling suns before we land on Canaan's coast. And and as we as we walk through those few more rolling suns, Father, we need help. We need grace, we need continued mercy, and we need more of you today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff.